Good morning again, everyone, and welcome to morning worship and prayer. As we prepare our hearts, let's believe that we will have an encounter with God, that we will behold His presence as we worship Him again this morning. Lord, we enter into Your presence now, and we come before You, surrender ourselves, surrender our concerns, surrender our families, and trust, Lord, that You'll continue to do a work in each of our lives. We worship You now in Jesus' name. Amen.
Holy Spirit, thank you that you are here with us today. And we respond to your voice. We respond to your leading, Lord, by yielding to you now. Lord, lead us. Help us to understand where exactly you'd want us to go. Lead us now, Holy Spirit, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Again, good morning. We continue with our series on being Spirit-empowered. And we're going to read this time from 2 Corinthians chapter 3, from verses 16 to 18. In verse 16, it says there, But when one turns to the Lord, the veil is removed. Now the Lord is the Spirit, and where the Spirit of the Lord is, there is freedom. And we all, with unveiled face, beholding the glory of the Lord, are being transformed into the same image from one degree of glory to another. For this comes from the Lord, who is the Spirit. Have you ever desired for a greater measure of freedom in your life? Like being free to, being free from certain sin habits, being free from certain struggles that continue to bug you down. You know, if, you know each time as you walk with God, you feel certain things that prevent you from being able to obey God fully. Would you like a greater measure of freedom? You see, the work of the Spirit in our lives brings a lot of that freedom. In verse 17, it says there, Now the Lord is the Spirit, and where the Spirit of the Lord is, there is freedom. This word freedom carries with it at least two meanings. The first one would be a legal type of freedom. The second one would be a moral type of freedom. The legal type of freedom meaning that you're actually free. You're no longer in prison. The moral type of freedom is, yeah, you guessed it, the ability to be, it's without license. You could be licentious. <laughs> you could do whatever you like. But on the other end, on the other end, we know that kind of freedom has actually put us into bondage. You know, many of you, many of us who have, uh, you know, at some point in our lives abandoned all standards or abandoned boundaries. And we just wanted to do what we wanted to do. And we, in fact, resented people who kept telling us what we needed to do. And we said, hey, this is my life. And just let me live it, okay? I want to do what I want to do. The problem, though, with that kind of perceived freedom is that it has actually resulted in a greater bondage. Because you remember this. You experienced this, in fact. When you got into more of the alcohol, <laughs> The alcohol also got you in the process. When you got into more of the drugs, the drugs also got you in the process and you could not get out. When you got into more of the sexual promiscuity, the sexual sin also got you and you could not immediately get out. So you immediately understand it's not the kind of freedom that you would really want in life. In fact, we'd like to be able to redefine it now by saying that moral freedom is not the liberty to do what you want to do, but the liberty to do what you ought to do. Because being free from sexual promiscuity brings so much peace in your family and in your personal life. Being free from the addictions, the common addictions that people face today, allows you to be able to live a life not bogged down by all of the anxiety, all of the concern, all of the lack of power or empowerment that comes with a life filled with addiction. That's the work of the Spirit in our lives. You know, this particular, that, that verse that we just read, that the Lord, that now the Lord is the Spirit, and where the Spirit of the Lord, there is freedom. The Spirit of God brings these two freedoms to you. A legal type of freedom and a moral type of freedom. The legal type of freedom is this. In the previous verse, it says there, but when one turns to the Lord, the veil is removed. The veil is that which prevents a person from believing in Jesus Christ, from, from receiving the salvation that He purchased for us uh, you know, on the cross. In fact, many of us lived that way before. Uh, we tried to be able to gain our salvation by our own ability and strength, by our good works, by our ability to be able to meet a standard, live by a certain religion, and be, you know, and like 
just being able to do everything that's asked of you and live by do's and don'ts. But we also know how frustrating that life was. I mean, we never really knew where we stood with God. We never really knew if we were really pleasing to God or not. Now, it says there that the Spirit of God is able to remove that veil so that, so that you might finally receive the salvation that comes from the Lord Jesus Christ. You need to hear this. Some of you who are, who, who are here right now, you need to hear this. You need to put your faith in the Lord Jesus Christ and receive the work of the Spirit that will finally set you free from your futile efforts at saving yourself, but rather you would put your trust in Jesus Christ alone for salvation. You see, Jesus, He's like the greatest miracle. <laughs> you know, He was born of a virgin, lived a sinless life, died on the cross to pay the penalty for your sin, but was raised from the dead by the Spirit of God, proving that He indeed, He indeed, Jesus is the Son of God, and that He now offers forgiveness of sins and eternal life to anyone who would repent, who would turn from their sins, and then who would believe in Him. That's the first layer of freedom that the Spirit of God brings into our lives. Have you experienced this freedom in your life already? Now, the, the second layer of freedom is the idea of the moral freedom, the, the grace, the ability to be able to live as you ought to live. And, you know, we, we would sometimes describe that as sanctification, that the Lord would progress you from one layer of holiness to the next, that the Lord starts you out as already holy, You've been set apart for Him. And yet, at the same time, you would see that holiness spread into more and more areas of your life. More and more, you see that your morality grows, that your being able to obey God's commands grows, your ability to love, your ability to be kind, the grace that's on you to be patient, the grace that's on you to be able to forgive, it begins to grow. Uh, you know, the good works in your life begins to grow too. Your kindness, your service, the way you would forgive others, the way that you would overlook offense, the way that you would serve other people. And that's called sanctification. And even that is the work of the Spirit of God. In the next verse, verse 18, it says, And we all, with unveiled face, unveiled face, now that, you, now that the veil has been removed, now that you've already turned to the Lord, and we all with unveiled face, beholding the glory of the Lord, are being transformed into the same image from one degree of glory to another. The glory of God. That's the way that we would perceive and understand who God is. His glory would include His nature, what we understand about Him. His glory would include His, om or his omniscience, His omnipotence, His omnipresence, His attributes. His glory would include how, how He communicates to you and then you feel His peace and you feel His joy and you feel His work and His presence in your life. His glory is how is that little bit, portions that we get to experience about Him. His glory is what you understand when you read the Bible and you realize how God loved us so much and how, how, how great and loving and he, you know, how, how great His mercy is for all of us. All of that is little bit portions of being able to behold the glory of God, the glory of God. And apparently, Beholding the glory of God causes us to be transformed into the same image of God, Christ-likeness. That's moral freedom. That's being able to live like Christ. The idea of Christ, uh, Christ-like character, that's us experiencing that moral freedom. And it says in the passage that we get transformed into the same image of Christ from one degree of glory to another when we behold the glory of the Lord. That word behold, you know, means at least two things. The first one is to be able to see. You get to see who God is more. You get to know Him more. You get to perceive Him more. How, we do, how do we do that? Well, many different ways. When people talk to us about God in the context of, say, small groups or discipleship, someone is discipling you and talks to you about God, we begin to behold the glory of God. We get to understand who He is. When you read the Bible yourself, you begin to behold how great He is in Scripture. When you pray and you experience the, the sense of peace, assurance that comes from God, when you know that your prayers are being heard by God, you experience His presence, you behold God's glory. When you worship, 
whether that be in your personal time or when we gather together as a church, when you worship and you, and you experience God's presence, be, you know, coming down upon that worship hall or coming down in your own room as you worship God, that's you behold the presence of God. When, when God uh, gives you an understanding, a new understanding of who He is, and you just, whoa, it's like boom, it blew your mind to be able to understand that that's who God is. That's you beholding the glory of God bit by bit by bit piece by piece. And that beholding apparently transforms you because as you come to know more of who God is, the more of Himself brushes off on you. Which brings that to the next meaning of behold, the idea of reflecting. So to behold, to behold as to see God, but also to behold as in a mirror or to reflect as in a mirror. So it's almost like the glory of the sun is reflected by the moon. The moon does not have a glory in itself. The light of the sun that comes on the moon gets reflected back on, back on us here on earth. And when we stay in the presence of God, when we put ourselves in the place where we can get to know God more, understand who God is, expose ourselves to the very presence of God as we read the Bible, we pray, we worship, we fellowship with other people, as we, um, as we obey God and you know God's presence comes upon you in that moment of obedience, as we take certain steps of faith and, and God's presence supports you as you go through the valley of the shadow of death. I mean, whoa! When if, even in those moments that you let your shepherd come beside you with his rod and his staff that comfort you, even in that moment of weakness, of struggle, of valley, when God's presence is there, you also behold the glory of God, such that even in your weakest moments, you can still reflect God. The more of God's glory rubs off on you as we stay, as we take more and more opportunities to be right in His presence, to expose ourselves to His glory. And when we do so, when we get to know God more, when we stay in God's presence more, we are being transformed into the same image from one degree of glory to another. I love that. I love that because that gives me a lot of hope. Oh, okay, so my life can change. I can have more love and peace and joy in my life, yeah, by exposing myself more to the presence of God who is the Spirit. So when I do things that are related to God, I actually, you know, His glory rubs off on me a little bit more. And you actually experience this already to a certain degree. Those moments in your life that you don't know, but just your heart changed. Your heart just changed. I mean, after reading the Bible, your heart changed. After spending an extended amount of time in prayer, your heart changed. Your, your motivations changed. You got encouraged in your spirit. Those moments that you sit down and just listen to other people, you know, in your small group or be as you get discipled by another, your heart changes, your mind changes in that moment. It's, it's almost like the work of God becomes very real in your life. That is beholding the glory of the Lord and it transforms you. It gives you moral freedom, the ability to do what you ought to do. And all of that, it says in the latter part of verse 18, for this comes from the Lord who is the Spirit. To summarize, this passage talked about two things. The first one, the kind of freedom that you can receive from the work of the Spirit. The kind of freedom from our sin. The kind of freedom that brings you salvation where the veil of God is removed. Oh, my prayer is that if you have not done that yet in your life, oh, I ask you that you would respond to God today. In fact, I want to lead you in a short prayer. If you're saying now, that I, my, the veil is not yet removed in my, in my eyes. I, I would like to ask God to save me, to bring me. I want to put my faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. I'd like to invite you in a short prayer right now. Say with me, Lord Jesus, I recognize your life, your death, and your resurrection and all that you have done for me. Right now, I ask for forgiveness for all of my sin and believe in you as my Savior, that only you can save me. And as the Spirit of God proved you to be the Son of God when He raised you from the dead, so now I believe in you too as the Son of God and my Lord. Lord, would you remove the veil and would you help me behold your glory? Would you save me today? In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Congratulations for those of you who responded and pray that prayer from your heart. In this moment, the veil has been removed, and now you can behold the glory of God.
Now for the rest of us who continue to desire that God would do a deep work in our hearts, that He would set us free from certain sin habits, struggles that still prevent us from being able to obey God fully, in this moment, let us behold the glory of God. Let's see Him, understand Him, know Him, and let His presence rub off on us. And let, let the fruit of the Spirit continue to grow in your life as we continually behold the glory of God. Let's pray together. Lord, for the rest of us, we desire for a greater work of your sanctification in our, in our lives. Holy Spirit, we yield ourselves to you now. And we surrender, asking that you would do a work in our hearts. Lord, remove our wrong desires. We yield them to you. Lord, remove our, remove our wrong direction. Lord, we respond to your direction now. Lord, would you remove our wrong reactions, God? Would you do a work in our hearts, God, to cleanse us from within? We confess our sin to you and we surrender. We ask that you would cleanse us from all unrighteousness. And Lord, continue to change us deeply from within today. In Jesus' name, amen. Let's worship God together. And as we do so, let's behold His glory yet one more time. Let's go into His presence. With your power, your presence, we will go to the ends of the earth. With your power, your presence, we will go to the ends of the earth. With your Lord, thank you for the work of your spirit that happened in our lives today. Lord, you cause it to progress and to grow. We want to be able to continually behold you, that we might see you, know you, love you, understand you, and then we would reflect your glory to the world around us. Lord, bless your people today. May the Lord bless you and keep you. May the Lord cause his face to shine upon you and be gracious to you. And may the Lord turn his face toward you, grant you peace. In Jesus' name, amen.